Welcome back. My name is Eric Martineau, and this is my wife, Diane. Again, we met in the Marine Corps many years ago, about 30 years ago, and uh, Diane was an intel officer, and I did system security and IT. So we've been involved with securing data and networks and computers for many, many years. Uh, today, we're going to go over the PCI DSS requirement that's inside of version 3.2.1, which is requirement number one, which is all about secure firewalls. Hope you enjoy it. Let's go. As we saw in the introduction, there are six goals for set forth by the PCI DSS standard. Okay. And uh, they begin with build and maintain secure network systems, and then go on to protecting cardholder data, et cetera. It's those six right there. And then inside of those six goals are 12 requirements. Now today we're only going to deal with one of those, which is the very first one, install and maintain firewall configurations to protect cardholder data. This is our first line of defense. Okay, so requirement number one, build and maintain secure network systems. If you wanna use that in just a couple of words, that's thou shalt not get in and thou shalt not get out. If somebody does get in, they're not able to get anything out and in the first place they shouldn't be able to give. So that's what this is all about. All right, protect cardholder data in the cardholder data environment from both inbound and outbound traffic vulnerabilities. I will say this a number of times. The biggest vulnerability that an organization has is from its own people. Disgruntled employees, dishonest employees. That's why you need to lock down protocols even on the outbound side. Why? Because if you give somebody permission to get into the network and then they can sneak stuff out with being caught, without being caught, that is the biggest vulnerability around. So you need to lock down outbound traffic just as much as you have to worry about some hacker in Ukraine hacking into the network, okay? <clears throat> All right, it is broken down into five different segments. 1.1, set up configuration standards. When you see that word standards, think documentation of those standards. 1.2, restrict connections between untrusted networks. 1.3, prohibit direct public access from the internet to cardholder data environments. We're going to lock down. Nobody from the internet is going to be able to get to our cardholder data. You're going to have to go through a DMZ that the merchant owns before they can actually get into the cardholder data environment. 1.4, install firewall software and all systems accessing the cardholder data environment. And then 1.5, we're going to have to document we're gonna to have to train people. We're gonna to have to enforce all policies and procedures. So we'll find that that's a catch-all on almost every single requirement to document, train, and enforce policies and procedures. All right, let's go more in depth. Requirement one, build and maintain a secure network and systems. 1.1, establish and implement firewall and router configuration standards that include, there's a number of them. 1.1.1, a formal process to approve and a formal process to test all network connections and any changes that take place to the firewall or any router configurations therein. Okay, so what does that basically mean? You have to approve all network connections. They have to be approved by management or someone. Then you have to test all of those connections. And then anytime there are major changes to the network, you're gonna to have to run back and again, approve those changes before they're made and then test them once they are to make sure that they're still sound and secure. All right, 1.1.2. We need a current network diagram that identifies all connections between the cardholder data environment and all other networks, and that includes wireless. This is going to be a detailed diagram that has IP addresses and every single box and switch and router and database that is in your cardholder data environment. So this is everything, a very detailed network diagram. Now the next one is 1.1.3, and it says to have a current data flow diagram across all systems and networks. In other words, where does the data begin? Where does it move to next? Where does it go next and et cetera? So this isn't a as detailed as the network diagram, but it is going to detail the flow in and out of your network of cardholder data. Very important. 1.1.4, firewalls at each internet connection and between the company's DMZ 
and the company's internal network. And that's what they call it, the internal network or the cardholder data environment. Those are synonymous to the PCI environment. So when you hear internal network, you're talking about the cardholder data environment. Because again, the company is going to have both a DMZ where they've got the, the, their network, and then you're also going to have inside the company an internal network that's, that's sectioned off from the DMZ and from the outside world. All right? And then 1.1.5 a description of all the groups and all the roles that are going to be played out. You know, like who are the database administrators? Who are, what's the, what happens with a sysadmin? What happens with a database administrator? What are their responsibilities? So all of the groups, their roles and their responsibilities for managing the network components. 1.1.6, a documented business justification for all the services, all of the protocols and all of the ports, as well as we have to document security features implemented if we have anything that is deemed insecure protocols. And you're thinking, why on earth would we even implement some insecure protocols? I can think of some ideas. We'll talk more about it when we get there. But let's just say, for instance, um, an old software package that you've got that you want to keep around, it's legacy, and you don't want to, um, <clears throat> you're not willing to get rid of that software package, but it no longer has patches. So because the company's no longer selling it and there's no longer any patches, that becomes an insecure protocol or port or a service or software. And so all of that has to be, and I know that's probably not from a firewall standpoint, that's more of a software standpoint, I'll admit that, that example, but um, anything that's considered insecure that you're implementing needs to be documented too. And then 1.1.7, a requirement to review firewall and router rule sets at least every six months. So again, back to that same example, and I know it isn't a perfect one in the router world or the firewall world, but let's say that you do have an old software system that, that uh, let's say the company that was selling it decided to quit do, selling it as a, uh, you buy your license and you own it for life, but now it's a uh, software as a service and you don't want to pay for it as a service, so you're willing to keep the old software. That might, again, it's not a firewall example, but it gives you an idea as to why those rule sets would be there because at some point, maybe marketing that owns that software says, you know what, we don't really need that anymore. We're gonna move into the software as a service environment. We're gonna get an upgraded software system and, and that's what we're gonna run with. Again, that isn't necessarily a network issue there and I'm using that as the example, but I'll give you an idea as to why a rule set might have something in it or why we need to look at them every six months because at some point, something you've done in the network, an old piece of gear or something like that may no longer be necessary for the company. And so if you're going over this every six months, uh, you can get rid of it because old software that's no longer patched is a vulnerability. All right, sorry for belaboring that point. 1.1, establish and implement firewall and router configuration standards. The PCI DSS standard tells us why we should be doing this under what's called guidance, okay? So firewalls and routers are key components that manage authorized access as well as control unwanted access into and out of our networks. As such, corporate-wide configuration standards help ensure as a first line of defense against bad guys. Simple enough. All right, 1.1.1, formal process to approve and test. Formal process, documentation folks, who loves it? <laughs> all network connections. So there has to be a formal process to approve and test all network connections and any changes to firewalls and router configurations. We went over that already, we already mentioned it, but that's what we have to do. All right, so the guidance, why is it they're saying we should do this? Well, we prevent problems caused by misconfiguration of network devices. Without formal approval and testing of changes, updates might be missed, okay? Which leads to inconsistencies between what's documented as a standard and what's actually out there in the real environment. I worked at a place uh, where I was um, in charge of 5,500 servers. Can you imagine if we didn't have documented configuration standards for all 5,500 servers? It would have been a nightmare. So uh, just because you've got a small network, only a handful, don't think that this isn't going to be of benefit. So again, a formal process to approve and test all network connections and any changes. All right, 1.1.2, 1 
a current network diagram that identifies all connections between the cardholder data environment and the other networks, which include wireless. I grabbed this one off the internet, but you can see, you know, you've got your data center and then it shows the corporate and then it shows the retail outlets for the company, right? And then it's got in different colors, that which is in scope. In other words, that which is part of the cardholder data environment. And then what's green there is showing what's out of scope. So you need a very detailed uh, network diagram showing all of the components within your network, okay? Why? Well, here's the guidance. Without current network diagrams, devices could be overlooked and unknowingly left out of security controls. You're upgrading with patches or whatever, right? And thus a vulnerability or a compromise can be left open. So that's what we want to avoid by having the network diagram. We know all the pieces and parts that are within the network diagram. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but when uh, Target got caught in a huge uh, breach of their data, you know how the people got in? Through their HVAC system because they had an automated wireless HVAC, right? That, you know, kept temperature control and somebody got in through that and then got into their cardholder data environment. So why on earth did they have their HVAC system inside of the cardholder data environment? And I bet you, and I don't know this is true or not, but I bet you if you had asked them for their network diagram, it would not have shown their HVAC wireless or, you know, wireless control module that was inside and had an IP address that was the same as a sub subnet of the cardholder data environment. But they did. Again, a reason to have a, card, uh, a network diagram. Okay, 1.1.3, a current data flow diagram across all systems and networks. What does it look like? Again, this is a much more simple diagram. You've got the card holder where it begins, then it comes into say a call center, right? And then it goes back out, it goes through the internet and then over to our payment service provider. Bam, that's all that the merchant has to show because once it gets into the hands of the payment um, service provider, they take responsibility for that risk moving forward. So a, a data flow diagram is a little bit more, uh, less complex, let's just say, than a data um, network diagram. So let's talk about the guidance or the why behind having a data flow diagram. A data flow diagram identifies where cardholder data is transmitted through the network, where it is processed and where it is stored. Okay, a data flow diagram will help us identify the scope of the cardholder data environment and how data flows across and through the network systems and devices. Let's go back to the scope. Scope is a term that we use frequently in the PCI DSS environment to discuss what has to be part of an audit that you do. And so if you can scale down that scope, you don't have as much equipment in it for an audit. So that's why they're talking about having a data flow diagram so it can scope out what really needs to be part of and what can be segmented away from the cardholder data environment. All right, 1.1.4, a firewall at each internet connection and between the DMZ and the internal network. Again, when you hear internal network, think cardholder data environment. Here's a depiction I took out of one of the uh, PCI DSS PDFs that's available online. And you'll note that we've got the public internet, then we've got a DMZ, and we've also got what's the private or corporate network. And really you should read into that last part that's there in green, the cardholder data environment, okay? Why, why do we want to have all of those separate? A firewall on every internet connection, both in and out of the network and between the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, which is the, something that belongs to the merchant, the corporation, and the internal network, which also belongs to the corporation. Okay. This minimizes access to the internal network or the cardholder data environment via unprotected connections. 1.1.5, a description of the groups, the roles, and the responsibilities for the management of network components. As I said earlier, you have to know who's in charge of what. You need to know what they need to understand their roles because I believe that's probably where in my opinion, 
where things begin to fall down is because the sysadmin thinks, oh, that's a database administrator responsibility. And the database administrator says, no, that's a sysadmin responsibility. So if those things, those responsibilities are not delineated properly, that's where things fall through the crack. Well, I thought the sysadmins were going to patch that. Are they? All right. So what's the goal? This ensures that personnel are aware of who is responsible for the security of all network components. If roles and responsibilities are not formally assigned, devices could be left out and unmanaged. Like I said, well, I thought the sysadmin had it. Well, I thought the database administrators had it. Gets rid of all that finger pointing. 1.1.6, a documented business justification for all services, protocols, and ports. And document any security features implemented for insecure protocols. Why would you have an insecure protocol? Maybe you've got an old box that's no longer supported by a vendor, but it, it, it plays a key role in your network, okay? So you have to then justify why those are there. <clears throat> what if I told you this traffic was normal? Again, if it's traffic that's normal, but it's unsecured, then you're gonna to have to document why it's gonna to have to be approved and you have to show what you're doing to keep that secure. Okay, so the guidance or the why behind having services, ports, protocols, all have a business need. You know, I think that one's probably one of the most important. And the reason is, is that let's say your sysadmin or your router folks or your database folks, are they running around checking what all of the needs of the company are? No, they just implement many times, right? And so if they, we had this protocol authorized beforehand, well, we still have that protocol need, right? If a software package that, that um, marketing runs needs a certain port open, well, the sysadmins just think, okay, well, that's how it's always been. That's how it'll always be. But we need a real business need because if marketing gets rid of that software and we still have that port open, and we're no longer using it, maybe, just maybe, that port will become vulnerable at some point in the future, right? As, you know, some hacker figures out how to use an old protocol with something new. So that's why we have to have a business need for all this stuff. And then we go in and we disable and we remove unneeded vulnerabilities. So if the marketing department's no longer using a software that's asking for a specific port, then we get rid of it. Okay, companies don't always, and this is because, as I was just saying, companies don't always patch unsecured services or ports. So if marketing hasn't been using something for two years, get rid of it, you know? And that's why we're gonna to be told we have to go and talk about this stuff every six months. But approval should come from an independent personnel. So somebody other than, it needs to be approved by somebody other than those that are asking for it. Uh, and there needs to be some rationale behind it because uh, it's not like as if the network folks just sit there idle and quiet as old protocols get re-upped every single, um, every six months by whatever department. All right, 1.1.7, a requirement to review firewall, router, rule sets every six months. That's what I was just talking about. So marketing has to come in and say why they need a port open into the data environment. Or maybe I'm using a bad example because I, I can't think of a reason why. Well, maybe marketing does need something. Uh, or, or finance, that would probably be a better example. Finance may need a port open so that they can get in and verify something on a credit card, right? Uh, something of that nature. Let's say it's a recurring debit that comes to somebody for a, for a software solution that you provide every single month. And, and let's say that finance needs in. That's probably a better example than marketing. So finance was using an old software that used a certain port but then they quit and they went to a better software or a newer version of that software and they no longer need that port open. Well, unless you go through that every six months, you might not figure that out and leave a port open that shouldn't be left open because it provides us with a vulnerability. So again, every six months, we're going to go through and look at this. Every department that says they have need for access into the cardholder data environment is going to justify the ports that they need open. And if they're no longer needed, the requirement is to disable it. All right, so why do we do this? A review cleans out unneeded, outdated, and incorrect rules. Only authorized services, ports, etc., with a justifiable business need should be in the network. Otherwise, you get rid of it. You block it. You turn it off. You disable it, etc. All right. There you go. There's 1.1 and the, for the, the router and configuration standards, and then all the things we need to look at to approve the network standards. All right. 
build firewall and router configurations that restrict connections between untrusted networks and any system components in the cardholder data environment. So note what it says here. An untrusted network is any external networks belonging to the entity themselves under review and or which are out of the entity's ability to control and or manage. So 1.2.1. Restrict inbound and outbound traffic to that which is necessary to get in and out of the cardholder data environment. I just pounded that one home a second ago. And specifically deny all other traffic. 1.2.2, secure and synchronize route configuration files, router configuration files. 1.2.3, install parameter firewalls between all Wi-Fi networks and the cardholder data environment. Only allow authorized traffic between any Wi-Fi networks and the cardholder data environment with business justifications. And then deny all others. Okay, 1.2, build firewall and router configurations that restrict connections between untrusted networks and any system components in the cardholder data environment. And no, trust me, I'm the sysadmin, doesn't cut it. So build a firewall and router configurations that restrict connections between untrusted networks and any system components within the cardholder data environment. So why? It becomes imperative that we install network protection between any trusted and untrusted networks, firewalls. Proper firewall configurations must control and limit traffic into and out of, I've already talked about that, company secured networks. So how's that look? Restrict inbound and outbound traffic to that which is necessary. In other words, it has a business justification for cardholder data environments and specifically deny all of the traffic. We've already said this. What this is really telling us that we need to do is to segment. So this cardholder data environment that's there in green, it needs to be segmented. When I say segmented, I'm talking about an IP address range that's different from, say, the DMZ. And that's what that switch is doing right there providing us a subnet that only belongs. And so if we were using the simplistic model here, there's only four pieces of gear, two application servers and two database servers, well, I guess on the switch, that are within the cardholder data environment. That's it, nothing else should be in there. There should be no other IPs out there on our network that sit within that subset of, of IP addresses, okay? So why are we given this? The examination of inbound and outbound connections allows for inspection and restriction of traffic based on the source and the destination addresses, thus limiting traffic between untrusted and trusted networks. All right, 1.2.2, secure and synchronize router configuration files. Why is that? Well, the guidance is pretty simple. Since active router configuration files are current and secure, Startup files must be updated, i.e. synchronized with the same secure settings. Synchronization ensures that router restarts have the same secure settings as running active configurations. The problem is you're gonna make or you might make changes to a router that's actually up and running. And unless those are saved, when that reboots, it's gonna go back to where it was at before you made those changes. So that's what this one is saying. All right, 1.2.3, install perimeter firewalls between Wi-Fi networks and the cardholder data environment. And then only allow authorized traffic, i.e. with a business justification, between Wi-Fi networks and the cardholder data environment. And deny all others. We've seen this before. Again, this time it's dealing with the Wi-Fi. Why? Well, <laughs> the known, or in this case with Wi-Fi, the unknown, exploitation of Wi-Fi is a common way that malicious people gain access to our networks and the cardholder data environment. If a wireless device or network is installed without the entity's knowledge, a malicious individual could easily and invisibly enter the network. Um, I think this one is extremely important and the reason is simple. Um, you know, if, if a visitor comes in and you've got certain jacks that are there that a visitor can use, you know when they plug in, you see them hardwired into that jack. But obviously with a wireless environment, no. Uh, again, I scratch my head trying to figure out why you would have cardholder data in a 
data center environment where you would need to justify having wireless if the data center is also acting as the data center for others. Um, your sysadmins that are working in the data center could obviously just go over and physically plug in with a console. Maybe there's a justification for it, but that's what runs through my head when I think about this one. All right, 1.3. Prohibit direct public access between the internet and any system component within the cardholder data environment. You're going to have the internet, you're going to have a DMZ, and then you're going to have a subset of that that's firewalled away that is where the cardholder data environment is. So implement a DMZ to limit inbound traffic to only system components that provide authorized public accessible service protocols and ports. 1.3.2. Limit inbound internet traffic to IP addresses within the DMZ. Again, this is your area that you control. Nothing from the internet should be getting into um, your CDE, and so you limit it only to places within the DMZ. 1.3.3, implement anti-spoofing measures to detect and block forged IP addresses or source IP addresses from entering the network. This is what some people will try to do. If they can figure out what your IP addresses are, they can send traffic, which usually shows up with a, um, uh, the IP address of the real source, and they can spoof it to make your system think that it's coming from within the CDE and therefore is allowed. And 1.3.4, do not allow unauthorized outbound traffic from the cardholder data environment to the internet. Once again, I'll say it a hundred times, your biggest threat is a disgruntled or malicious or dishonest employee who has access already to get into the cardholder data environment and then wants to send it out. So you need to restrict uh, even those people that have rights to get in there from sending anything that's in there someplace else. All right, so let's go through these in a little bit more detail. 1.3.5, permit only established connections into the cardholder data environment. All right, 1.3.6, place cardholder data environment system components that store cardholder data, in other words, a database, in an internal network zone. They'll call it the internal network many times inside of the uh, PCI DSS paperwork. Segregated from the DMZ and other untrusted networks, okay? 1.3.7, do not disclose private IP addresses and routing information to unauthorized parties. So they're not broadcasting their IP addresses out there. All right, 1.3. We're gonna go through this now in greater depth. 1.3, prohibit direct public access between internet and any system components within the cardholder data environment. Why? Well, although the public untrusted connections are permitted into the DMZ, like your web servers, right? These connections would never be permitted into the cardholder data environment of your network, so the internal. So here in the green section, you do not want to allow anybody from the internet to get in there. The internet people can get into the red area, which is your DMZ, through a firewall, but again, only equipment in the DMZ can get into the cardholder data environment for queries and things of that nature. All right, 1.3.1. Implement a DMZ to limit inbound traffic to only system components that provide authorized, publicly accessible services, protocols, and ports. Why? Well, the DMZ manages connections between the untrusted network and the services that an organization needs to have available to the public. Again, like a web server, as we stated, which is in that red area of the DMZ. Obviously, if you're showing... Um, a list of the products or services that you sell on your website, you need people from the internet to get there, but you're not gonna allow them to go from there into the cardholder data environment. All right, 1.3.2, limit inbound internet traffic to the internal network, in other words, the cardholder data environment, to IP addresses within the DMZ. Again, nothing from the internet can get in there, only something from within the DMZ. So why? Well, if we limit traffic into the internal network, the cardholder data environment from the internet, only through IP addresses within the DMZ, this keeps malicious individuals from using services or protocols or ports that are unauthorized. 
1.3.3, again, it states, implement anti-spoofing measures to detect and block forge source IP addresses from entering into the network. Why do we do that? Normally, a packet, as I said earlier, contains the IP address of where the computer uh, actually came from, right? Or the original computer. Malicious individuals try to spoof or imitate the sending IP addresses so that the target system believes the packets are actually coming from a trusted environment. Filtering packets coming into the networks helps to ensure packets are not spoofed or that they look like they are coming from uh, and originating from within the network. All right, 1.3.4, do not allow unauthorized outbound traffic from the cardholder data environment to the internet. I just spoke about that one. Why? Because all outbound traffic from the cardholder data environment should be evaluated to ensure that it follows established and authorized rules. Restrict connections to only authorized traffic. Restrict source destination addresses and ports and or blocking of content on anything else. All right. Um, that's it, nothing else. You, as I said, the biggest threat in and to the, the cardholder data is a malicious or um, dishonest or disgruntled employee. And so we really do need to worry about locking down that traffic going out. All right, 1.3.5, permit only established connections into the network. Why do we do that? A firewall that maintains the state or the status of each connection knows whether an apparent response to a previous connection is valid. Authorized responses or is a malicious traffic trying to trick the firewall into allowing the connection. So only allow established connections um, into the internal network, the, the CDE. All right, 1.3, that's six. Place system components that are within the cardholder data environment which store cardholder data, in other words, databases, in an internal network zone, that's the green area there, segmented by a firewall, router, and switch probably, from the DMZ and other untrusted networks. You'll notice there that we have the public internet, we have the DMZ, and then we have the cardholder data. And within the DMZ is a firewall, and then within the cardholder data environment here, we also have a switch. And that would probably have a subnet that is only for the cardholder data environment. Back to uh, 1.2.1 when we talked about segmentation. So this green area here is going to be segmented from everything else inside of the network. So why do we do that? Here's the guidance. Securing system components that store cardholder data in an internal network zone segregated from the, the DMZ and other untrusted networks by a firewall can prevent unauthorized network traffic from reaching those system components. All right, 1.3.7, do not disclose private IP addresses and routing information within the cardholder data environment to unauthorized parties. No one needs to know what that subnet is all about. Again, this comes back to the segmentation that we were talking about in 1.2.1 that implies that we need to segment it. Again, the smaller that segment of of cardholder data environment is, the easier it is for us to do a complete audit. So get as much stuff out of there as possible. All right, 1.3.7, do not disclose private IP addresses and route information to unauthorized parties. Why? Well, restricting the disclosure of internal and private IP addresses is essential to prevent a hacker from learning the IP addresses of the internal network and then using that information to gain access to the network. All right, 1.4, install personal firewall software on any portable computing devices that connect to the internet when outside the trusted network and which are also used inside of the cardholder data environment. Now think about that one for a minute. That's going to cause some issues because it might be that someone that has authorization to get into the cardholder data environment, one of your employees is also at home working on their computer, right? So this requirement applies to both employee and company owned portable devices. Anyone that's going to use a, a, a device to get into uh, the network. Computing devices that connect to the internet outside of the cardholder data environment 
are more vulnerable to threats. Again, that's not at the exact same time because obviously somebody could have their laptop at work and they're inside of the cardholder data environment at the, the uh, data center, right? But when they go home, they bring that computer with them. Now you've got a separate issue. All right, computers that cannot be managed by the corporate policy introduce weakness and provide opportunities for exploitation. 1.5, ensure that security policies and operational procedures for managing firewalls are documented in use and known to all effective parties. Again, we're gonna see this one at the end of almost every single one of these um, requirements that we document, we verify that it's in use, and that everyone that's involved in the security here understands what's going on. So why the guidance? Again, that's what I just said. Personnel need to be aware of and follow security policies and operational procedures to ensure firewalls and routers are constantly managed to prevent unauthorized access into that portion of the network. All right, recap. Again, requirement one, build and maintain a secure network systems by protecting cardholder data within the cardholder data environment from both inbound and outbound traffic vulnerabilities. Step one was to set up configuration standards. Two, restrict connections between untrusted networks. 1.3, prohibit direct public access from the internet to the cardholder data environment. Number four, install firewall software on all systems that access the cardholder data environment. And 1.5, document, train, and enforce all policies and procedures.